As we start, uh, let me uh, say a prayer, if you would please. Almighty God, as we study this amazing vision of your glorified and risen Christ, we pray that you would help us to understand the truths that we need for today's world, for the times that we are living in. Dear God, today as we study your words, your only words directly to your church, we pray that you would help us to see where we fit in this vision that you have given, these messages that you have given to the church. We pray that you would, above all, Teach us more about yourself as we go through this study. In your name we pray. Amen. As I was saying earlier, I appreciate very much Asbury working out how uh, and helping me get this going and being recorded on YouTube. The uh, other thing uh, that we were uh, talking about last week, and I don't think I said, but for those new to this book, and for those that may see this on uh, YouTube uh, this week, I welcome you all also. But we are uh, using the book, the Book of Revelation, The Smart Guide to the Bible by Duck and Richards, uh, easily obtainable through Amazon or ChristianBook.com. But as you use this book, the one thing that I hope you in the class have found, and if not, that in the back... On page 344 are the charts. The other thing that's in the back is the answers to all the questions at the end of the chapter. Because I'm not really good about uh, specifically covering questions. I tend to spend more time going verse by verse in the Bible and doing explanations. So if as you're studying it during the week, you want the answers to your questions, please check the back of the book and or email me. I would appreciate it. Always, always, always email me if you have any questions or if there's something I said that I didn't sufficiently explain. For those that are new, I hope that you will take time as you're getting to the introduction on page uh Roman numeral IV, uh, or four, page four, Roman number four, in your book is a list of reasons to study prophecy. Prophecy is almost a third of the Bible. It's estimated between 27 and 30 percent of the Bible. Almost a third of the Bible is prophecy. And there are Prophecies after prophecies after prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in extreme detail. 300 of them about Jesus Christ. Keep in mind that of 300 prophecies of Jesus Christ fulfilled in his first coming, there are eight prophecies. For each prophecy for the first coming, there are eight for the second coming. So God gave a lot of word space, if you will, in his book to the fact that he's going to come back. So we need to understand. We need to know and be ready. The other main thing that Jesus told us is to be ready. And that's also in this list of reasons on page Roman number four. If it, there's a loving God and there's this major event coming uh, and or major tribulation on the world, a loving God would warn us. And he does. He warns us. Hey, Miss Connie, welcome. So he warns us and he tells us to watch and be ready. In Luke 12, 35 to 48, Matthew 24, 42 to 44, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 John chapter 5, he says, watch and be ready. You remember the parable of the thief? If somebody comes and Jesus said he's coming as a thief in the night, 
he's not coming as a thief in the night for those that are watching for him, right? If you know the thief is coming, he's not coming as a thief in the night for us because we're ready and we know he's coming. We're not going to be surprised. And how many of us react better when we've kind of had a heads up as to what's coming? So we look at the world today. And studying this shows us that God is in control. Another reason to study Revelation. None of the stuff that's happening is a surprise to God. He's not going, oh, now what are we going to do? In fact, he's telling us that it's, he's telling us exactly how it's going to play out. And he's in control. Now, we don't always understand what he's trying to tell us, and which is why I will send you a lot of resources and would you, uh, so you can make up your own mind. As we talked about uh, last week, that there are uh, different ways to view this book. Uh, these are not mutually exclusive. Exclusive, and I narrowed it down to the main four. There are infinite variations on each one of these. There's one group that says this is all past history, that it all happened in the age of Nero's when the church was undergoing severe persecution, and that this was written kind of in code to get it past the Roman authorities. There is another viewpoint that says it's an outline of history from Pentecost uh, through to the Millennial Kingdom. This was very uh, prevalent viewpoint during the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. Uh, this was the viewpoint that John Wesley adopted because uh, basically they couldn't understand Revelation. It made no sense. So they decided that somehow it was an historical outline. The next viewpoint came from Origen and St. Augustine uh, in 350 A.D., who said it's got to be an allegory. It makes no sense whatsoever. Therefore, it must be an allegory. And that's kind of the way the Catholic Church has viewed it, and most mainline Protestant churches have never questioned that uh, and never uh, they just take the traditional viewpoint. Then there's the futurist viewpoint, which is what I will be presenting to you because that's the one that makes sense to me. And that says that starting next week from chapters four onward is all future. And that is uh, in the outline that I gave you, which we will um, see today. And this outline that we talked about, like last week, we have the first chapter is uh, all about Christ as the high priest and Christ seen in his glory, where Christ is claiming to be the Alpha and the Omega, claiming uh, to be one with God, claiming to be God. We talked about that in the book of Revelation, the Trinitarian concept is more developed than anywhere else in the Bible. Many times uh, in this book, uh, Jesus claims to be God. Today, we will be talking about the church age. Next week, we will talk about the rapture and start getting into the future point. But the today on chapters two and three is the Christ and the church. These were seven actual literal churches in John's day. It's also thought to be letters to the churches throughout the ages. In other words, every church throughout the ages has fit into one of these categories. That doesn't mean they haven't changed categories if they cleaned up their act. That doesn't mean they didn't change categories if they started uh, believing in heresy. It also is individual Christians. And this is talking about an overarching viewpoint. Because we all have 
some elements of each. But what is our overarching main way that we uh, have our relationship with Christ? So each of us should fit in one of these seven categories. And like I said, it's present day churches. All of our churches fit in one of these categories uh, as our overarching way we relate to Christ, as the overarching way we accept or deny the truth of the Bible. So uh, like I said, we will um, talk about the, the church ages uh, today in a little bit more of a review chapter uh, one from last week the first verse it's a revelation of jesus christ when we get a revelation we get an unveiling a revealing right of something that's going to happen um and we're promised a blessing in verse three for just reading it and studying it now, how many of you get a blessing out of reading an astrophysics book? Anybody, anybody, any, do I have any astrophysicists here? Anybody get a blessing out of reading an astrophysics book? Not many of us. So, how can God promise us to bless us with this book? If, like so many in the world today say, well, that's impossible to understand. It's just too complicated. There's just too much symbolism. There's no way I can understand that. It doesn't make sense. That can, how can God promise a blessing? Again, it's a revealing and unveiling of Jesus Christ. And the main way it's a revealing or unveiling is because it shows us at the Christ who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It shows us that he's coming back in splendor and glory. He's going to take back his earth. He is going to redeem it and restore it. And we are going to be part of that. We read last week in Daniel chapter 7 that glorious picture of Jesus approaching God the Father, the Ancient of Days, to receive his kingdom. Remember, um, it is, and Daniel's another book to study if you're interested in the end times, because Daniel lays out all, all the, the time frames, if you will, because if you remember, he had the visions of all the, uh, the different kingdoms of the world. And in Daniel 7, at verse 13, Daniel looked and saw there was one like a son of man, the title for Jesus, son of man. Daniel saw him. Daniel saw him. Uh, as did uh, Isaiah, by the way. You know that Isaiah chapter 6, when he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, he saw Jesus. According to John 12, Isaiah saw Jesus. He had a vision of him. So he's, uh, Jesus will be coming with the clouds of heaven. He approaches the Ancient of Days, was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So that's what this book is about. That's why we study this book. We look at the world today and we think, oh, my goodness, you know, um, talking about going to hell in a handbasket. But, but we read this and we see what the future is. And mm -hmm. so it is meant to give us great encouragement and to give us a much greater vision of who Christ is. Like I said, in the Gospels, he's the suffering servant. In Revelation, he's the coming king. Mm -hmm. 
and he claims to be uh, one with God many times. He claims to be the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, and let's see. We talked uh, in verse 4 of chapter 1. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, which is Turkey in today's world. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, who is to come. If you remember the Old Testament scriptures, uh, starting in Exodus, God always defined himself as who, who was, who is, who will be. His phrase for eternal, who was, who is, who will be. John changes that and makes it who was, who is, who is to come. So all the way through the book of Revelation, you might note uh, that as you're, as you're reading, that John changes the verb tense on that. And he talks about in verse 5 how he's the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. We haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen that yet. This is not some abstract vision. This is Psalms 2. And it's talking about how Christ will literally rule the world. Then uh, it's talking about in his blood. Another revelation that we get of Christ as we go through the book of Revelation is he is called the Lamb of God more times in the book of Revelation than anywhere else in the Bible. It's, we're talking about sevens in the book of Revelation. Jesus is the Lamb of God 28 times in the book of Revelation. And we will talk about that more next week in uh, chapters 4 and 5. He's the Lamb of God. Verse 7 in chapter 1. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him and see him in glory. Even they who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. That's talking about the second coming when every eye sees him. The rapture uh, won't be seen by the earth. And we'll talk about the rapture next week. Chapters 4 and 5. So this is talking about the second uh, coming. And again in chapter 8, he says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning of the creator, the end, the consummation, and the king, the, and the Lord Kairos, who is, who was, who is to come. He's coming. Most of our churches don't talk about it, but he's coming. And in a couple of weeks, we will talk about all of the signs that are being seen now, all the prophecies that are in stages of fulfillment which is how we know we're at the end. And like I said, so if you'll stay with me, uh, some of these classes can be a little bit difficult to take in because of the subject matter. But if you'll stay with me uh, in a couple of weeks, we will talk about all the signs that are being seen now. First and foremost, above all others, do your own research. Check it out and see what you can find. Number one, Israel became a nation in 1948. Primary, above all others, sign that we are in the end times. Okay, then again, in verse 11, he's claiming to be the Alpha, the Omega. He's one with God. He's the beginning. He's the end. Then John, in verse 12, turns to see who's talking to him. And he turns and sees this vision of the glorified and risen Savior in all of his glory, in his priestly robes. Can you imagine, and like I said, we I don't know how often you've tried to imagine, but something to think about, because think what John, not think what Paul saw on the road to Damascus. It was so glorious, so overwhelming, so holy, so powerful, that it blinded him. Then, 
This is the God we're going to go see. This is who we believe in. This is the one who's guiding our daily lives. Somebody, as John, well, when it gets to verse 17, John said, when I saw him, I felt like I was dead. This is John who spent three years, three and a half years with Jesus. This is John who has spent 60 years if he was 95 when he wrote this, like where it is thought, with all those years becoming a very mature Christian, he's given this vision. He sees Jesus, and what happens to him? He falls over like he's dead. It, the second coming happens, the victory at Armageddon happens because he shows up in his glory. And we'll talk about that when we get there. <clears throat> That's who is our Savior. He came as our Savior, but what he has planned for our future is beyond description, as John said in his epistles. So, in verse 19 of chapter 1, John is told him to write down what he sees. And all the way through this, we'll say, see John saying, I saw it. Or I heard it because John is being given, if you're going with the future interpretation, John is being given of something 2,000 plus years in the future. He couldn't very well say these aircraft carriers were pulling into the harbor. He couldn't very well say everybody saw it on TV. <laughs> right? He didn't have a match. He didn't have a word for a match yet. So God gave him the vision. John describes it and writes it down as best he can using the language that he's got. Right? Describes it as best he can. Origin in St. Augustine in 350 A.D. said this makes no sense. It's got to be an allegory. Well, in Revelation 13, if you'll please stick with me that long, in Revelation 13, it talks about needing a number to buy or sell. Can we imagine that? Mm -hmm. Most of us can imagine mm -hmm. a number to buy or sell. Mm -hmm. So, I'm suggesting to you that these things that are now happening can be seen in what John was describing. So you can go through this together. We will, uh, you can see what you think and see if it makes sense to you. And uh, that brings us to chapter 2 of Revelation. And he's talking about the churches. As we said, these are churches uh, throughout the ages. And these are seven uh, churches that he um, is talking about. They have a combination of strengths, weaknesses, characteristics that convey lessons for all of us. Chuck Messler, and I highly recommend that you uh, Google his sermon series on Revelation, says that if, as a Christian, if we want to grow, then there is Christ's words to describe the church in these two chapters. That that's the main ones that we should study. Then, the other thing we need to understand is that to be part of a church means to be uh, reborn spiritually. That means that we have accepted Christ as our Savior. We have repented of our sins and asked him to come into our hearts, as you heard in Sunday school, and to hopefully give him rule over our lives. I've given you a lot of scriptures here. 
But my point is, and the point in understanding these letters to the churches is, it's not a particular denomination. It's not about how often we've attended. It's not how much money we've given the church. The whole question of whether or not we are part of Christ's church is whether or not we have been reborn, as Jesus told Nicodemus, uh, when Nicodemus came to see him in the night. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? And they walked and talked with God. They had all this communion with God. They were walking and talking with Christ, pre-incarnate, of course, because no one has seen God the Father. But they were walking and talking with Christ. Then they sinned by doing their own thing and listening to Satan. Remember, God told them, if you eat this tree, you will die. Mm -hmm. But they didn't die physically, right? They died spiritually. They no, they no longer had intimate face-to-face -face communion with God because now there was sin in their life and they were no longer totally holy. God's spirit doesn't live in unholy, sinful beings. So we need to accept Christ as our Savior to be spiritually reborn, just as Jesus told Nicodemus. Our soul and these separations of the spirit, soul, and body is in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It's also in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 23, if you want to look it up. So our soul is our self-consciousness. My soul is me. My soul is Linda. It's my ego. It's my will. It's my emotions, my personality, my reasoning. So in other words, if my soul, when I wake up on Sunday morning, says, no, God, I don't want to go to church today, then I'm putting myself above what Christ wants me to do, right? So the question is, who's the ruler in my life? Does Christ rule my actions or do my soul, my what I want to do, how I feel about the whole situation, is that what's ruling? The power of the soul is to be under the dominion of the Holy Spirit, operate under the Spirit's strength. And that takes a lot of study of the Word to understand what all that's about. And of course, our body is our world consciousness, how we interact with the, the world. And the flesh is also part of the issues that we have to deal with. Because sometimes my body is just too lazy to get up and go talk to that neighbor next door. So we war, we fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Whether we're listening to that devil on our shoulder, whether or not we are subjecting our flesh, our body, to what Christ needs us to do, and whether or not we're listening to the world and all of the cultural things that the world is telling us. You know, do we watch all those R-rated movies? Do we, you know, read all those uh, wonderful books that are out there about, we won't go there. So in these churches, uh, Ephesus is the first church that's listed. And on page 17 of your book, it points out something that is called the historical prophetical view. And this is the idea that these churches also just happen to coincidentally give an outline of church history. Nothing coincidental about the Bible, obviously. But this is man's theory, as it says at the bottom. This is man's theory. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to me. Obviously, he gives you in your book on page 17, Tim LaHaye, Hal Lindsey, Vernon McGee, and Damon Duck, the author of the book, agreed with this viewpoint. Again, do your own research. Um, John MacArthur does not agree with this viewpoint. But Ephesus 
in the time of John was a church that was uh, in a town uh, known as Ephesus, of course. And this was a town called the Queen of Asia, the capital of Ionia. They had a glorious fine harbor. It's the main line of communication between Rome and the East. It was a huge city in, uh, back in the day when John was writing this. But it was also a stronghold of Satan because they had a temple to Diana, which of course is the fertility goddess with all the immoral sex. They had, and of course, one of the ancient uh, seven wonders, they had a temple of Artemis. There was a major bank there. There was a lot of superstition in the occult. They did have Paul for three years. They had Aquila and Priscilla. They had Timothy and the Apostle John. So they did have major um, apostles come to establish the church there and to help them grow. It, uh, their theater, by the way, held 25,000 people. But in verse 4 and 5, or in verse 2 and 3 on chapters 2, Jesus said, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. So he's telling them what they are doing right. And he says, you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. You have found them liars. You persevered. You have patience. You have labored for my name's sake, and you have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand, remove your church from its place unless you repent. So this is... In the prophecy theory, this would be the first original churches. This would be the apostolic churches from about 33 uh, to 100 A.D. So this is kind of like uh, Christians today, and I don't know if you've experienced in your life, but as you grow and mature in the Christian faith, you lose that first excitement or love from when you first became a Christian. You know, it's kind of like when you were dating, you had all, just you just got all tingly, even thinking about, uh, you know, your uh, husband-to-be or your bride-to-be. And now after 48 years, it's kind of like you know what they're thinking. So, you, don't, you know, it's not quite so much of that... <laughs> just dying to be with them anymore as it used to be. And that's what's happened to this first church. How uh, we become acquainted and then kind of lose our uh, fervor for something. And that's what's happened, like I said, here. And his promise for this church is that they would eat the tree of life uh, and 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says all believers are overcomers. But there are things that we need to be working on. In verse uh, chapter 2, verse 7, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, we have to be willing to listen. We have to be willing to accept correction. We have to be willing to grow in our walk with Christ. So him who has an ear, let him hear. It's our choice. It's our will, what we're going to do. It's our will, whether or not we're going to spend every day in the word. To him who overcomes, I will get to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God, from the Garden of Eden. So, like I said, theory Prophetic theory says that this is would be the first church. In today's world, there would be lots of Christians in this category. There may not be original churches as much, but there would be lots of Christians that might fit this category. Then, in um, to the church in Smyrna in Revelation two eight, angel of the church in Smyrna, 
These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. And what we didn't talk about for the Ephesus was notice that the picture of Christ is exactly what that church needs. So this is the church, another that was a glorious big learning center. They had the first temple to Caesar, another very wealthy, uh, huge area that um, center of learning and culture, great trade city on the river Hermes, Hermes, very wealthy and commercial. They worship Cybele, Apollo, Escapolis, Aphrodite, Zeus, and the Roman emperor, thrown in for good measure. This is the church that is the persecuted church. So Jesus presents the picture of himself to them as the one who is the first and the last, God Almighty, who died and was resurrected. So he's promising all these martyrs the resurrection if they stand firm in him. He tells them this is a church that endured extreme poverty. Most of the uh, people who were part of this church were slaves. If you remember the book of Acts and how many people either lost their jobs. This also had extreme persecution because of something called the Ten Percenters. And this was the time of the emperors. So this was when it was very popular. If you turned somebody in uh, as not worshiping the Caesar or the gods, if you turned them in for being a Christian, you automatically got 10% of their property. Can you imagine? This is also uh, the Jews who claimed the Christians were cannibals because of the communion table. Uh, this is, uh, so not to mention the what, this church was going through because of the Caesars. As you can see there, there was an estimated 5 million martyrs during this time. And on the page 24 of your book, it gives you a list of those Caesars. It also gives you a list of the crowns just above that. And if you've never studied the crowns, uh, you might find that very interesting. And we will maybe talk about that more next week when we talk about the Bema Seat. This is a church that knows what they believe and they're sticking to it. This would be the church in China today, the church in Indonesia, the church in Iran. These people are not lukewarm because they're risking their life to go to church on Sunday. These people know what they believe in. These people are spending time in prayer and in the word because they need it because the world outside their front door is extremely dangerous. So, like I said, this is the persecuted church. And in verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be heard by the second death. One of those charts in the back of your book talks about the two resurrections. So it talks about the first death is spiritual death. The, I mean, the first death is physical death. The second death is spiritual death. So those who are not believers will die spiritually. They do not get, their spirit does not spend eternity with God because they've never had the cleansing blood of Jesus over them to make them qualify to be in God's presence. Okay? So, no second death is no spiritual death. Then, the next church on page uh, 26 in your book says, To the angel of the church in Pergamos, Right, these things says he who was, has a sharp two-edged sword. The sharp two-edged sword is in uh, Hebrews 4.12, and it is an idiom for the word of God 
the truth and how the word of God can divide even between the soul and the spirit because of the absolute truth that is the word of God. Uh, this, uh, so the picture of Jesus like his word of God because this is a compromised church. And he said, he gives them uh, a compliment in that I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. So Pergamos was a stronghold of Satan. Uh, you hold fast to my name. You did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Again, uh, still martyrs. Verse 14 and 15, I have a few things against you, though. You have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. You have also those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, things which I hate. We're not sure who the Nicolaitans were, but... One idea is that the Nicolaitans were the one that first started elevating the lay the uh, the Greek all above the above the laity and started trying to rule the church. If you remember, the church at first was a uh, they had leaders, but no one was ruling over everybody else. And so it's thought that this is when, uh, like I said, a lot of people were, were teaching about the need for rulers. So the problem with this church is that they've become doctrinally compromised by the Nicolaitans. Remember back in the Smyrna church, they were not tolerating that. Now you come forward to this church and it's become part of the church. They've compromised. They've let it in. Are our churches today compromising and letting in all these worldly attitudes? So it's just compromised, obviously, by paganism, immorality associated with all those pagan gods, Greek philosophy, which included Arianism and Gnosticism. Arianism is denying the deity of Christ by saying that Christ was the first created being. He's not really God. Would you be surprised to know that 72% of Christians today believe that? According to Pew Research, 72% of Christians today don't understand that Jesus is God. Gnosticism is kind of that we're all a little God and that we have to learn how to increase and be enlightened, uh, that God is the universe and the universe is God, and that in today's world is called New Age. It's still here, New Age. Promise to the overcomer is that they will be uh, given the bread of life, the manna, they will be given a white stone. You may not be familiar with a white stone, but back in John's day, there weren't too many uh, emails or cell phones or even paper to write a letter on. It was extremely expensive. So if somebody went to court, they were given a white stone if they were proven innocent and a black stone if they were proven guilty. So they could go home and pull the white stone out of their pocket and prove to their family and friends that they had been cleared and declared innocent. We are declared innocent as believers in Christ. We will be given a new name, a name that only he knows, because, because with your bride, with your groom, you have pet names for each other, right? That's how much he loves us. He has pet names for us. And this is thought to be the married to the world church somewhere. Now, all these times that are given on this are very subjective because, as you know, the attitudes in society, the beliefs, the rituals, 
the things that are commonly accepted kind of shift and change, ebb and flow, and there's not one set cutoff. So these are general approximate times, but when the church merged with the state under Constantine and began, uh, started progressively compromising in order to gain favor with Rome. And as you all probably have studied in history, one of the big, huge compromises was Christmas because that was the big pagan holiday and Constantine's trying to keep his empire together. So he's trying to placate the pagans at the same time he's trying to placate the Christians and he convinces the Christians to have a big holiday at the same time as the uh, Roman Saturnalia. So, like I said, it's a big part of uh, living in the world. Okay, Thyatira is um, on the bottom of uh, page 29. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write these things, say the Son of God, who has lives like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. The word Thyatira means continual sacrifice. So this would be a church corrupted by heresies. This was a military town at the juncture of three main roads and uh, and th they were guarding Pergamus and it was a uh, big area for compulsory trade guilds and unions because it was a manufacturing town and a military town. And of course all the guilds or the unions were under pagan deities and the Christians there who wanted to earn a living pretty well had to belong to one of these trade guilds and go to the annual uh, orgy that was associated with this pagan deity. So Christ presents himself as the divine judge or the flame of fire for purification. As you know, in scripture, fire is either purification for believers or judgment for unbelievers. Two main meanings of fire in the scriptures. He praises them for their works, their love, their faith, their service, but they're tolerating a lot of false teachers. And the false teachers were teaching and leading them. They were letting, they let this lady into the church. Probably she was a historical true lady, and they thought her name was Sambathe. And she's leading them into false doctrines, pagan practices, like she was a Christian, I guess, and came into the church, and they're tolerating her, but she at the same time doesn't want, she doesn't want to quite give up all of those gods she had, and all of the uh, comforts or whatever they provided, so she's now teaching this polytheism, pantheism, and of course Gnosticism uh, in the church, and he promises us as believers, if we will get rid of the heresy in our life, the things that we accept that are not biblical, that we will rule on the throne with Christ. The idea in the prophecy part for this church, once again, uh, very estimated time frames, would be the medieval church. With the heresies, tolerated or that caused the Crusades, the Inquisitions, Muslim, Islam was taking over the world at this point, um, but at the same time, the church is dividing over language and icons. So we will talk about Islam more when we get uh, to chapter 13, if you'll stay with me. So the tribulation uh, it, that is promised to this church um, in verse 22, indeed I will cast her into a sick bed. There were a lot of plagues during this time of history. And those who commit adultery with her, that is churches committing adultery with the world, will cast her into great tribulation. And you can see there that the, the question of the reference to the tribulation is whether or not this was all of the <laughs> that were slaughtered by invading hordes during this time in history. 
And that, again, is speculation. What we need to understand is that are we in a church that's being corrupted by heresies and or are we tolerating heresies in our relationship with Jesus? Then you get to Sardis, which itself is a precious stone. But as you read through this, you saw that Sardis is a dead church. Uh, and the picture of Christ, he presents himself to this dead church as one who is full of the sevenfold spirit of God. Like I said, the praise only for the remnant that's left. But they're warned to watch in verse 3. And it's verse 3 uh, of chapter 3. says, remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. If you will not watch, I will come up on you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come up on you. These last uh, four, three, three or four churches are considered to be the main type or character of churches at the end times because there is a reference to Christ coming back for his church in all these last uh, three churches. But once again, he's saying if you don't watch, you're going to be surprised, right? If we have no clue what's coming, we're often surprised. So this is one of the scriptures, like we talked about, along with Luke 12, Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians, 1 John, where Jesus says, watch and be ready. He can't surprise us. If we're watching and we're ready, we know he's coming. So... The problem with this church, as you can uh, see, it says, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they will walk with men white, for they are worthy, and he who overcomes uh, will be clothed in white garments, his name will be in the book of life, and I will confess my name uh, before my father. But like I said, this is a church that... They were doing it out of routine, not because there was a lot of relationship with Christ. Uh, it was that idea of if I show up every Sunday and I give a certain amount of money and I do my darndest to be a good person, this is, the, this is that church. Um, so this is thought to be approximately the church from 1517 to 1750. Obviously, as you know, the Re Reformation happened during this time. But as far as Luther, and you probably know, he was trying to correct his church. He was not trying to divide it. But the printing press happened to be developing at the same time. And a lot of his friends, before there were copyright laws, published his stuff and sent it out everywhere. So um, that basically made it beyond his control. But this is a, but these churches, he never questioned their view on the end times and or Jesus coming back to rule and reign. So most churches, most mainline churches uh, have never questioned it. This was also the time, of course, when the Catholics killed the Protestants and the Protestants killed the Catholics. So uh, this is, they did not have, for the most part, the life of Christ in them. And it shows in this church. It's basically a dead church. It's, it's just a huge bureaucracy with a few true believers in it. The Philadelphia Church is the Church of Brotherly Love, the Missionary Church, uh, and 
There is lots of praise for this church. They've kept his word. They're evangelistic. They didn't deny him. They waited on the leading of the Holy Spirit. He has no problems with this church. Uh, verse 9 talks about, uh, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet to know that I have loved you. It's thought this could be a reference to replacement theology, which um, started around this time. It especially grew during this time, which was the idea that the church replaced Israel in God's plan and promises. So replacement theology is the church replacing Israel. The one thing to keep in mind if your church subscribes to this viewpoint is if God threw Israel over because they didn't obey the law and meet his standard, then what are our chances? So this church is promised a pillar and God sanctioned. Uh, you need dinner? I would like it, yeah. So we're heating it up now. We'll probably be ready in about five or ten minutes. Okay, well, uh, I'm taking my revelation class right now. And Ted, I would say. Your name kept from trip. Uh, just come down. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. Prophecy. Uh, this church would be the military, would be the missionary church. Uh, started to return to the literal interpretation. Uh, including the second coming, people started to realize, the church started to realize that these things that are described in this book were coming onto the scene. Um, of course, there were industrial revolution, and there were also a civil revolution in the United States and in France. But we also came up with Darwin. Okay, if you've never studied Romans chapter 1, there are three stages of wrath as uh, for God, uh, for people refusing him as creator. I hope you will take your time to look at this, but it talks about that they suppress the truth about the creator willfully. So God steps back and gives them over to sexual immorality. Then it talks about they're still denying the truth down the road. Uh, so he steps back. He removes his hedge of protection. And removing his hedge of protection leads them into more shameful lust and greater debauchery. In Romans 1, 28, 32, they become so filled with every kind of wickedness and evil, greed and depravity, God steps back once again. And now the people no longer even have true reasoning ability. It calls, it, de it calls it a debased or depraved mind. The reason is crippled and they can't even make sound judgment anymore. You can decide if you see that happening in the world today. The Laodicean church in Revelation 3, 14 to 22, the word means rule of or by the people. This is the church that is ruled by people making the decisions based on earthly standards. This is not a church that is ruled by the Holy Spirit with people sitting around a conference table waiting on the Holy Spirit to show them which way to go. This is the people's church. If, if the uh, Holy Spirit uh, is taken out, you never know it. It's a, it's a huge bureaucracy. It's uh, run using the latest technology. Most of them have lots of money. Uh, and I hope you'll read the background on this church because the background and the descriptions of the background are very symbolic of exactly what was happening to this church. So Christ pictures himself as faithful. This church is not. As a true witness, this church is not. As the creator God, which this church is denying. Uh, there are no praises for this church. In fact, for this church, 
God said, you are so bad, you make me sick. This is a church of spiritual indifference, which you can also read in 2 Timothy. This is a church very unaware of just how spiritually naked and carnal they are. This is a very self-sufficient, wealthy church. Uh, the people are self-satisfied because we don't normally day-to-day -day need God, you know. Uh, this is a church that has promised that if they sit on the throne, they will if they repent, they will sit on the throne and rule with Christ. This is thought and prophecy uh, to be, like I said, this is a theory, to be from about 1900 when things, when a lot of churches started realizing that the end times were coming to the rapture. There's a lot of postmodernism, new atheism, new age Gnosticism. This is the church that if you will turn, uh, he says, Council Gold Refined by Fire. This is the famous verse where he talks about standing at the door and knocking. You've heard that many times. You've probably got a picture in your house of Jesus standing at that door and knocking. Keep in mind that the context of this letter is it's a letter to the church. Jesus is standing outside the door of this church knocking to be let in. Yes, it's true, the symbolism in that picture of he's knocking on the door of our heart and asking to be let in. But the context is a letter to a church. And he's saying, won't somebody, won't anybody, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. The church is dead. He's now asking individuals to let him in. This is the way I see in church. If he will uh, open the door to me, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on the throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. This is, many think, uh, the church, for the most part, again, not all churches, this is just the main description of the church worldwide this is not all churches obviously this is not the persecuted church in india or in china or in, in, in indonesia new age is a major thing we're going to be talking about i think that's pretty well where we're heading you can look up what alice bailey the main new ager said that it would take to get rid of churches and you can see how far you think we've gone in that area today but next week we will be talking about the future starting with the rapture and before you say the word rapture is not in the bible it's actually in the bible about 13 more times than the word trinity is so next week we will talk about the rapture and we will talk about chapters four and five. And the main thing for us today is to understand that we need to be watching and we need to be ready. As Jesus tells these last uh, three or four churches, be ready. If you're in a church like this, realize it. If this is your attitude toward Christ as your Savior, realize it, and we need to get ready, because Christ is coming soon. If you will, uh, let me uh, say a prayer to close, and then I will stay and ask, take questions as long as you want. Almighty God, we do thank you that you give us a warning that you prepare us, you're not trying to scare us, you're trying to say, come to me, fellowship with me, love me, dear God, so that we would truly be your bride. 
Dear God, we pray this week that we would be your witnesses everywhere we go to everyone we meet. That you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, so thank you for being here. Like I said, I will send you the link uh, in a day or two as soon as the church sends it to me so that you can send it out to anybody that might be interested. But in the meantime, any questions on these first three chapters? Had you ever heard this before about the seven churches? You'll have to unmute yourselves, which you can do, by the way, by just pressing the space bar and uh, they'll let up when you're done talking. But Linda, I've got a question. When you start in chapter one, it speaks to the seven churches as um, a geographical location. And then in chapter two, we're looking at them as a historical location i don't know i can't understand that transition how we go from a location to a historical chart of churches and how it relates to history good question ronnie very good question uh as i said that historical prophecy part is man's theory that's not in the bible but a lot of prophecy watchers think that those seven letters also seem to lay out church history through the ages. So whether or not you take that historical part, you can pitch all of that if you like. But those letters are to seven churches that represent the church for 2,000 years. In other words, uh, me as a Christian, I fit in one of those categories as my main perspective. I've also got other, we all fit in all of them, you see what I mean? But our main viewpoint, the main way we react to Christ is probably in one of those letters. So these seven letters are Christ's only words directly from him to us, his bride. And so, like I said, it's thought that every church is in one of these categories somewhere, not only in John's day, but today. Linda? Yes, Miss Connie. I also, I mean, every one of those churches can apply to every one of us at various stages in our lives. So really, if we would just read these two or three chapters over and over, it would help us keep ourselves tuned up. That's exactly what Chuck Missler says. Exactly. That, like you said, we, we do grow and then we backslide. I don't know if all of y'all are familiar with that term. That's a good Methodist term. You know, we, we, uh, kind of lose our way for a while. Um, but uh, I, I totally agree with you, Connie. And we also, we go through seasons in our life. When you were talking about they had lost their first love. I, I've been a Christian almost 70 years now. And we all go through cycles in our lives where we kind of come and go. It may get more intense and then, you know, like you said, after you've been married 48 years, you know, you go through a, a dry time. So don't get discouraged either when we hit a dry time, but just dig in with the word more. Yes. Yes. Very good. Very good. Uh, another question? I have one other, Linda. Good. Would you be... Uh, open to sending the slides to us after uh, each uh, lesson so we can kind of review them and, and mesh them in with what we've read? Sure, I can do that. Most weeks there won't be a lot of slides, but I'll be happy to do that. Great. Thank I you. really appreciate that also. You're welcome. Okay. Linda, was what we were looking at a slide? Yes. 
I want it too. Okay. <laughs> me, me too, I say. Okay. Well, keep in mind that that's Linda's edition. You need to do your own study. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons that I would like to have it. It just to kind of go back through the book on each church and and just, you know, see if I can pull out of it the same thing and and. If not, do my extra research. Okay. And again, I highly, highly, highly recommend you all uh, pulling up other authors on the seven churches. Uh, it's amazing. Again, Chuck Missler is amazing. I sent you all a link to his very first session. Uh, obviously, the other sessions will be linked to that if you pull it up. The... Um, most of the Calvary Chapel churches have excellent uh, sermons on, uh, and they in, they include prophecy in their uh, sessions. The uh, you can go to Pastor J D Farag. You can go to um, uh, Jack Hibbs is doing an excellent sermon starting like in late December on futures, and he's not going verse by verse. But he is, uh, I think I sent you all the link that very, very first week. But he's talking about what's coming and how it's crucial that we be prepared. So that we know if there's something we need to clean up in our life. But even more important, don't wait to tell that neighbor and think, oh, I got plenty of time. I've got months. Well, we might have months, but we might not. Good questions. Anybody else? And Linda, my power got was off, so I missed a little bit of this. I I'm think sorry. if you send out the slides, we will be good. Okay. <laughs> the electricity went out, just flashed off, and then back on. Of course, then your computer is messed up. So I'm back. I understand. Like I said, if that ever happens to me, y'all give me five minutes, and we'll all meet back together. But that'll be another advantage to the fact that the church is copying this for us. Mm -hmm. So you can go back as many times as you want. Because I did kind of run through it. That's the hard part about covering two chapters a week. Linda, how will we find the recording? I will send you the link when the church sends it to me. Yay. Yes. Invite everybody. Invite everybody. Uh, that most churches don't talk about this anymore because the pastors aren't taught it. It's not in seminary. There are too many other things they have to learn. And this is easy to ignore. Questions? Okay. Uh, again, uh, please email me. Uh, remember that if some of your friends or uh, neighbors want to um, get the handouts and the uh, informational links that I send every week, I will need their e email address, please. And again, encourage everybody to join us. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you, well, thank you Ms. Mary. Mr. Ronnie, appreciate it. Good to see you. We'll see you next week. Okay. It's so good to see all of you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Could you tell if my, were my dogs muted? Uh, part of the time you were, part of the time you weren't, I think. Oh, I th I thought I pushed it up there. Okay, so you did, you did hear them. <laughs> okay. No, not not like Alan's telephone call. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs> Thanks.